real cryptography when you have when you need real randomness. Um, creating keys, create even creating like session tokens. You want these to be cryptographically secure. Uh, so again, it's 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 important that uh, that this is on this list for that reason. You want to be able to. I mean, just just using like the system clock as the seed is not going to cut it for for high security. So uh, the fact that it's on this list uh, is is a great start. Um, we're we're going to focus in this session mostly on on hash because um, it's a, a pretty straightforward example. Um, so the, the the examples that I'm showing throughout are, are similar throughout all the different types of cryptographic operations across the frameworks, but just just for simplicity's sake. Um, so again, you see the uh, you see the hash algorithm abstract class at the top of this this UML diagram, um, and in .NET the the particular algorithms derive from uh, hash algorithm. So you see, uh, and this is just a couple examples. There are many, many more that I just didn't have space on the slide to show. So you see SHA-512 is another abstract class that derives from hash algorithm. SHA-1 is an abstract class that derives from hash algorithm. MD5 is, would, would be on here too. Um, SHA-256, etc. And then the particular uh, concrete classes that are instantiable derive from the uh, the abstract class of the algorithm. So you see the, the managed code implementation of SHA-512 is SHA-512 manage derives from SHA-512. SHA-512 CNG is another implementation, that the CNG implementation that derives from SHA-512, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are the classes that are concrete and, and instantiable. And this is the way that most people use them, is they just pick out the particular implementation of the particular algorithm they want, and they just, they just create, a, um, create a reference to it and new it up and start using it. So this is, this is 90 plus percent of the .NET code I see looks exactly like this, which is really unfortunate because this is not agile in any way. We've hard-coded the algorithm. We've hard-coded the particular implementation of this algorithm. There's nothing we can do to change this besides just going into the source code, um, which, which is unfortunate. Here's a much more agile example. Um, instead of saying, hey, I want MD5 CNG and create that, I'm just going to declare the abstract hash algorithm, and then call the create factory method on the hash algorithm. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to get back from that hash algorithm dot create, but I don't care. So this is this is again this is um, this is polymorphism at work. We don't we don't care, um, we don't care what particular implementation got instantiated. All I care about is said, hey, I want I want a hash algorithm, so so go create me one. And because that compute hash method that you see there on, on the bottom is a member of hash algorithm. The compiler doesn't care. This, this works great. And a much more agile example. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room right now is saying, this is not agile at all. You've hard-coded MD5 into it. I understand why you're saying that. It's not true. It only looks that way. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but I've got to cover the other frameworks first because they're all going to look exactly the same way. So from there, we'll move on to, to JCA. JCA, very, very similar to .NET, um, at least in terms of, of the, the abstract top-levelness. They've got a few more classes in here. Um, Cypher covers both symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Um, they've got a couple extra top-level classes for, for key generation. Uh, you see message authentication codes on here. Digests uh, are the, essentially the same thing as hash, signatures, et cetera. Also, you see random on here. Very, very nice. Uh, architecture. Uh, under the cover, slightly differently. Again, the uh, uh, if, if you're just a programmer using it, you're not gonna you're not gonna really notice any significant difference. But there, there's a little bit there's a little bit of, of difference going on underneath the covers that I should probably speak to. Uh, top level class here is is Message Digest SPI. Um, so everything everything that we eventually instantiate is going to have to derive from that. Now, the factory class, in .NET, the factory class and the top-level abstract were the same. It was just hash algorithm. Here, it's different. Message Digest uh, SPI is the top level. Message Digest, another abstract class, is the, uh, is the factory class. Now, um, Digest Base is the, is the base that all the, um, all the Sun provider implementations derive from. So you see down there, like MD5 SHA and SHA-2 uh, all derive up from, SHA, or from, from Digest Base. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, depending on the provider implementation. It, it can work slightly differently, but these are, these are going to be the, the most popular ones. Uh, so here's an example of what this looks like in code. Um, and it, it's identical to .NET, except just the names have changed. You say message digest, the abstract class, 
the abstract factory factory class md equals message digest dot get instance md5. Now having a message an abstract message digest, uh, we give it an array of bytes. We get back an array of bytes, which is the hash. Great. Now one thing one thing you may notice. Let me let me go back for a second. So when you say message digest dot get instance, you get back a message digest object. And you see from this, from this chart that these implementations at the bottom don't actually derive from message digest. So that appears to be impossible. But what happens, what happens under the covers is that message digest, uh, object or the message digest class wraps those in a delegate. So it's just, it's just transparent. And again, this is, this is just based on this particular provider. If you were writing your own, you could actually derive from message digest and be fine. Really the only important thing is that it eventually gets up to message digest SPI. And finally, finally, CNG. So CNG is the um, uh, next generation crypto API uh, designed as a replacement for, uh, for the Microsoft crypto API introduced in Vista, uh, still available to this day. Um, and a, a lot large part of this um, library came out of the, uh, the desire to have more, more agility. Pretty much everything in CNG is agile. Um, Key generation exchange, object encoding, data encryption, decryption, hashing, RNG, again, pretty much everything is agile, which is great. Architecture of CNG vastly different than the other two. Uh, CNG architecture works on an interface based basis. So the top level interface here for hash is called bcrypt hash interface. Um, so all you want to do, if you want to write a provider of your own, just make sure that you, uh, that you implement this interface bcrypt hash interface. And it's, it's, <laughs> It's probably it's it's probably more complicated than it appears. There's only one method in it, with this, which is called get hash interface, uh, but that returns a bcrypt hash function table, which is essentially just a big list of function pointers for all the other thing that a hash might want to do. So create hash, hash data, finish hash, duplicate hash, destroy hash. All those you have to basically implement in your provider, and then just pass the function pointers back as the items in in that structure to the get hash interface call. So just like the other ones, we're going to look at Agile and non-Agile examples. So you uh, declare up handles for the provider. You declare a handle for the hash. Um, sorry, this is, this is the non-Agile one. We're, we're going to back up to Cappy for a second. Um, call cryptoquare context to acquire a handle to the provider. Use that to create a hash object. And then having the hash object, hash the data. Now you see um, here in the, in the crypt create hash, uh, we're asking for MD5. We're saying CALG MD5. What this is, this is actually a, an integer defined in um, like a, a header file in the crypto API. So right off the bat, there's a problem here because when you have ints, there's, if you want to write your own, you have, you have this problem with, with, with potential collisions. Uh, what's worse than that is that if you do want to write your own, you still have to get it signed by Microsoft. Cappy won't instantiate any provider that's not signed by us. So that really does kind of a uh, limit your, your ability to, to extend the, uh, the platform. CNG, on the other hand, does not work that way. So it, pretty similar to Cappy, you, uh, you declare up your handles, you call crypt al open algorithm provider um, with, with, the, uh, with the algorithm you want. But in this case, it's just a string. So no, no weird messing around with integer or header files here, just whatever string you want. Um, you don't have to have the provider signed by us. You can write it as long as you have the permission to install it on the machine, you're good to go. Then you create a hash, hash data. Very, very straightforward. All right, now I talked about this a minute ago, and it's time to pay it off. So every single one of these, I've had that string MD5 hard-coded into the code. And I've sworn to you that it's not really, that it's still crypto agile. And you haven't believed me, but you're going to believe me now. Um, it would only be cryptographically on Agile, if there were no way to change what that string MD5 resolved to. Um, and that's not true. We can, make, we can change it to anything we want. I can change the particular implementations of MD5. I can say, instead of, you know, instead of implementation A of MD5, I want you to use implementation B of MD5. I can even change what algorithm it returns. I can, you can ask me for MD5, and I'll give you SHA-1 back, or SHA-512 back, or whatever I want to give you back. And this sounds crazy, doesn't it? It sounds like something you do in Fortran, where you redefine the value with a number seven. No, it's not like that. It's, it's, actually, it's actually very straightforward. 
I don't think it's a great long-term solution under a lot of cases uh, for a number of reasons that we will again get into in, in some detail. Um, but sometimes, under under extreme circumstances and for short-term uh, for short-term emergencies, I think this is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. But in order to in order to learn how to do it, we're going to have to learn how to write our own providers. So uh, so let's get into that. Um, the second step towards crypto agility is to is to reconfigure the algorithm provider. In order to be able to write our own providers, we really need to understand how the provider framework works. And we'll start with JCA. Um, so originally, the, the application does not uh, communicate directly to the providers themselves. The providers, just, uh, the providers just register themselves to the provider framework, and then the application talks to that. So in this case, we've got three providers. We've got provider A, which says it knows how to do SHA-1 and SHA-256. We've got provider B that says it knows how to do MD5 and SHA-1, and provider C that says it knows how to do MD5 and SHA-512. So in this case, when the application goes to the framework and says, hey, message digest, uh, give me an instance of MD5, the provider framework just iterates through all the providers that's registered to it in order. So the first one in the list is provider A. So provider framework says, hey, provider A, do you, uh, do you know how to do MD5? And provider A doesn't, so it says no. And provider framework says, that's OK, I'll go to the next guy. So provider B, do you know how to do MD5? Yes. Yes, I do know how to do MD5. Great. So provider framework instantiates that and returns it to application. There's also a second, there's, there's a second overload of get instance um, where you can name the specific provider. So the application can code itself to say, uh, message I just get instance MD5, and by the way, I really want provider C to do this. In this case, the framework won't even ask anybody else. It'll just go to C, and if it's available, it'll use it. Um, and I tell you that this is available for you to use, but you should never actually do it. And even, even Sun says, don't use this overload. Um, the problem, uh, among others, is that it makes it cryptographically unagile. Now, there's no way, once, you, once you've hard-coded this particular provider in, that's it. It's going to use that provider. There's nothing we can do to change that. So a really, really unagile uh, overload, but it's there, but don't use it. So how do, you, how do you configure the providers? Well, the first option is the easiest, which is just to go modify the Java security file on the system. This is the static option. So if you open up your Java security file on your box, you're going to see something like this. You'll see a number of lines. It's like security.provider.1 equals, which is probably Sun Security Provider Sun. Um, security Provider 2 equals something else. Security Provider 3 equals something else. And these are just the, the classes of the providers in order. And the ordinals you see here, it's one based. The ordinals you see here are the order in which they get searched. So you want to change it? Just change the ordinals. Just, you know, if you want SunJC to be the first one on the list, make that security.provider.1. Make Sun security.provider.2. Easy as that. Very, very straightforward. Um, option number two is the dynamic option, which is to do it in code. So you have your own custom provider. Um, you, you declare it and you say security.add provider. That, that's pretty straightforward too. What, what add provider does, it adds it to the beginning of the list. If this isn't good enough for you, you can call insert provider at. Um, and you can put it anywhere you want in the list. So you want, it to be, you want it to always be the first one searched, then say insert provider at one. Again, really straightforward. Don't ever use this either. <laughs> um, again, really unagile. Once you do this in code, it's locked. You're not going to be able to override it by going and doing the easy thing to modify the Java security file anymore. Um, th I mean, th there, there's some pros to this. A lot of people like this because you don't have to go users go messing with Java security files. So I get that. That's cool. But the, uh, the downside of it being completely unagile, I think, kind of, kind of outweighs that. And, and since you're all here to hear about agility, I, I suspect you would agree. Um, so here's one scenario. You just have a bad provider. The algorithm itself is still OK. Um, it's just this particular implementation is flawed, or FIPS reasons, or whatever. Um, easiest thing in the world. Open up that Java security file. Um, you know, provider.1 is foo, provider.2 is bar. Switch them. Or just remove, remove the one foo if you don't even want it on the list and make provider1 bar. Simple as that. So, super straightforward. Scenario two is when you have a bad algorithm, and this is unfortunately a much more difficult problem to deal with. This is, like, this is like the sneaker scenario I played out at the beginning. RSA is completely broken. AES is completely broken. So remember how the framework works. Provider framework is going to go iterate through each of those providers in order, asking who can, who can supply, like who knows how to do MD5? Who knows how to handle this algorithm that I'm asking for? So in order to...